welcome to the Hudson Library and Historical Society. My name is Amanda Flower. I'm one of the librarians here, and I'm also the author in residence. Um, I'm very glad and excited to introduce to you Cinda Williams Chima, who will be talking in just a bit. Before I tell you about all the great things about our visiting author today, I just want to mention a few things to keep in mind as you are aspiring and published writers in the area. Um, the library has a few programs that you can take advantage of here at the Hudson Library. We have Hudson Writers, which is a writing critique group that meets the last Wednesday of every month in the library cafe at 7. So you're more than welcome to drop in um, and learn more about that. Um, also, as I said before, I'm the author in residence at the library, so I do one hour, one on one critique appointments with people to go over their writing. So if you're interested in that, I'm happy to meet with you. Um, you can talk to me after the class and we can set up an appointment. And all these services, of course, are free. So be sure to take advantage of that if that sounds helpful to you. Keep in mind, you do have in front of you a list of the other writing to publish classes we have coming in the fall. I just want to highlight our next one which is Tuesday, October 23rd, which is Nuts and Bolts of Self-Publishing with Gloria Adams. So I think a lot of us will be very interested in hearing about that. Um, she'll be telling us some details about how do you get your book up on Kindle and Nook and all the rest of those places. Um, again, I'm thrilled to announce um, tonight that we have Cinda with us. She'll be speaking on the topic of world building and fiction. Cinda's books have received star reviews in Kirkus and Voya, among others, and have been named in Book Sense and Indie Next Picks. Um, she's also been the International Reading Association Young Adult Choice, uh, Kirkus Best YA List, um, Voya's Editor Choice, and many, many more. Her um, novels are here for sale, too, after the signing. Uh, courtesy of the Learn and Owl Bookshop here in Hudson. So I'm sure she would be happy to sign a book for you after uh, the event. Um, but please join me in welcoming Cinda. Now, see, you could have been anywhere in the world tonight, um, including watching the debate between Mike DeWine and Richard Cordray, so I feel really honored that you came out to, to see me. Um, I'm Cinda Williams Chima, and I tell lies for a living. Um, I used to get in trouble for daydreaming, and now I get paid for it. And how cool is that? Um, I always like to kind of get an idea of um, who's in the audience before I get started. So. Um, I assume you're all aspiring writers. Is, is that right? Okay. And um, are any of you writing um, fantasy right now? And um, what about other types of fiction? Okay, it's, it's cool to see um, a mixed group here because a lot of people um, tend to associate world building with fantasy. Like if your novel is set in Ohio, I don't really have to build that, right? <laughs> you know, because it's already here. Um, but all kinds of fiction ha involves world building. So um, hopefully there will be a takeaway for um, everyone here. Has anyone here um, read any of my novels? Okay. <laughs> All right, good. Um, that's not required, just. Uh, <laughs> um, so, um, I mentioned that world building is a part of all kinds of fiction. Um, setting um, would be um, where this applies. So whether it's a um, contemporary story um, set in um, the U.S. or long ago and far away, um, you have to put the reader in a new place. And I don't know if any of you have read Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda, but that's set in Atlanta. How many of you have been in Atlanta? Been to Atlanta? Okay. How many of you go to Simon's High School? 
So at the very least, um, the author has to put you in Simons High School, um, even if you've been in Atlanta. So um, all fiction writing involves world building. And uh, let me ask you this, if I'm putting you in a new place, do I have to do all the work? No, people are shaking their head. Why not? Why, why do you say that? Okay, she's saying the point of reading, you want the reader to do some of the work. And you, we definitely do. And I think one of the, what you'll hear from me all over and over again is uh, what you want to do is leave room for the reader. Even if you didn't go to Simon's high school, maybe you went to high school <laughs> at one time. Maybe that was a long time ago, but you still know something about high school, and each and every one of you would conjure up a little different picture of what it's like to be um, at Simon's high school. So um, my first series, The Air Chronicles, is set in the magical world of Ohio. Now, many people aren't aware that this is really a hotbed of magic. Um, and you can all thank me for building Ohio and then allowing you to live in it. But uh, again, if um, you might think, well, really, that doesn't involve world building, but I do events in New York City and they have no idea where Ohio is unless they move there from Ohio. And then they, they might remember. I mean, they're all like, is that near? I mean, when I spoke to my editor, um, my very first book sold, The Warrior Heir, she was like, oh yeah, we think it's really interesting that you chose to set it in Ohio. Where's that exactly? She didn't really say that, but you know, they all think it's like near Iowa. And I don't know if you've seen this New Yorker cartoon, but this is a New Yorker's idea of the United States. And so Florida's really big here, and Brooklyn is like three times the size of Ohio, and you've got Manhattan and all of that, and California is just kind of a little tiny place. So um, I have to put New Yorkers in Ohio. And so I used a lot of material that I, um, you know, they say write what you know. And I don't, I definitely don't adhere, adhere to that. As far as I know, I don't know any wizards, but they appear in my books. But um, my experiences in various parts of Ohio helped me build a world that um, New Yorkers could enjoy. So. Um, some of the um, events are in southern Ohio in a fictional t county called Colton County that's sort of kind of based after Jackson County. Um, Trinity, Ohio is a fictional town, but it's sort of kind of based on Oberlin. Anybody been to Oberlin? Okay. I moved it up on the lake, though, because I like, I like a water view. So, um, but it is, it's based after um, Oberlin. I had, at one point I had to get rid of a bunch of townspeople without slaughtering them. So I sent them to the salt mines under Lake Erie. And I had a boy write to me and he said, yeah, like there's salt mines under Lake Erie. <laughs> and I'm like, Google it. <laughs> Um, my last two Air Chronicles books, The Enchanter Air and The Sorcerer Air, a lot of the action takes place in um, the flats in Cleveland and the warehouse district. Um, so I spent some time, uh, you know, researching um, the warehouse district. Um, one reason that fantasy books have the reputation for um, world building is that sometimes it takes a little more space to create a world that involves magic, okay? Um, we have to work a little harder, um, but it's still gonna include um, familiar details. Um, you let the reader participate. 
So um, this is an example. I'm going to have you, does everybody have something to write with and something to write on? No? Writing workshop? Um, when, I, when I do workshops for teens, it's amazing. They'll be like, oh, nobody said. And I'm like, writing workshop? OK. So <laughs> this is um, just some memories I wrote down about a place that I worked when I was in high school and college. I worked for the Akron Beacon Journal in their phone room. And there's a picture of the phone room. Um, it was called the Barracuda Room by people that did not work in the phone room. The classified phone room of the Akron Beacon Journal was an office ghetto at the back of the building that led out to an alley. When the ink trucks parked in the alley, our eyes burned and the fumes nearly asphyxiated us. It was all women. The men worked in the field room and called on accounts. The ads were segregated too, help wanted male and help wanted female. And you can all figure out how old I am here. The clatter of typewriters was deafening, especially at the Sunday paper deadline. It was always too hot or too cold. We wore office sweaters that stank of somebody's old perfume. Once there was a bomb threat, and nobody told us. Everybody evacuated except for us. Got to get those ads in. And it, so I looked out the window, and I'm like, huh. That's the newsrooms over there. What are they doing? Yeah. So these are just some kind of like um, thoughts that came to my mind if I was going to try to put somebody in the Barracuda room. So I'd like you to take a few minutes and just write a few lines. It can just be bullet points. It doesn't have to be real formal. Think of a place that you're very familiar with and think of what sensory um, data, images, um, you know, sight, smells that you would use to put a reader in that place. And we'll take just a few minutes. Be one more minute. One thing to know about me is I'll never give you enough time. Anybody um, have one they'd like to share? Just. Okay, my, uh, my area is Civil War Farm, so I just took the five senses, and I just said, uh, the smell of horses and leather, the taste of the dirt in the air, there's no grass in the yard. Um, you see the whitewashed barn and house with a porch, water pump, and trough. You hear the horses neighing, the, men, the workers shouts and talk, and touch the dryness in the air, the layer of dust from the yard. 
are you there yet? Okay, thank you for sharing. Someone else? Just from a different perspective, maybe. Um, but the I thought for some reason it's been a long time. A locker room was under the grandstand. The sound of taping, smell of various ointments. Everybody had a special ointment that made them brave. Um, positive thoughts. We're going to win. That the shuffling sounds of the fans arriving because they were seated above us. Uh, then the door jammed as we charged for the field. Uh, nobody could get out, and our bravery just kind of went. <laughs> Hey, you know, and sometimes it's best, you know, you have to keep going and, you know, just keep writing things. And sometimes the smaller details will surface then. Most of us are visual and we'll tend to, you know, write down, you know, those kinds of memories. And then gradually we'll remember, you know, the ointment or, the, you know, some small detail. And sometimes it's just that particular detail that will be what the thing that puts the reader in that place. And because we're always making choices, right? About what to include and what um, not to. I'm all excited that I have a laser pointer. <laughs> so there I am. And uh, yeah, anyway. So I actually got the answer to this question from someone who attended a writing workshop I did. And I, um, you know, I threw out the question, you know, how do writers create believable worlds? And a young writer said, you take real life and you change it up, right? So um, maybe you take real life and you leave out the boring bits. That's what, what we really hope for. Um, now, sometimes setting um, is used to classify fiction. Um, in fantasy, often we have what's called urban fantasy, which is set in cities. Um, contemporary fantasy, um, the Air Chronicles would fall into that because it's ostensibly um, in the now. Um, high fantasy is set in an alternative world. Think. Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings or, you know, one of those. Um, historical fiction is that it might be just in the 80s. It doesn't have to be way, way back there, but you're trying to put a reader in a different time. These are some examples of teen urban fantasy. And, you know, Harry Potter is, is technically contemporary. It's supposed to be in modern day England, um, but then right away they go to this medieval setting, which is, you know, based on um, British boarding schools. And I'll ask teens, I'll say, do you go to a high school that looks like that? And they're like, and I say, do you wish you did? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> So uh, you have different options in fantasy. Sometimes the primary world doesn't exist, like Game of Thrones. Portal fantasy, where you go from what we see as the real world into a different world, like Alice in Wonderland. You go down the rabbit hole. World within the a world. Um, Harry Potter, the muggles don't really know about all the wizardry going on. Um, but after my Air Chronicles, I. Um, I've always had a love for high fantasy um, in a, set in a different world, long ago, far away. Um, and sometimes you really want to get away from the real world, right? And I've had readers tell me, your books took me away at a time that I really needed it. So um, these are some examples of high fantasy including the Seven Realms series. A queendom takes a stand against an evil empire. See what I did there? We have queendoms rather than kingdoms. Yeah. The inheritance goes through the female line. Um, and high fantasy setting is often an imaginary land. Uh, even in The Lord of the Rings, that was basically set in pre-war England, rural England, because Tolkien looked back to that time um, fondly 
felt like it was getting too modern. This is actually Tolkien's own drawing. Well, it's not the original. It's a slide made of it. Um, one clue to um, high fantasy is there'll often be a map. For example, I did not include a map of Ohio in the Air Chronicles because I figured if someone was interested, they could look it up. Um, but you'll often see maps in um, created worlds. This is Aragon. And I, I just included this map because I thought it was really cool. I was doing a, a short story that um, involved monsters in Lake Erie. And um, I discovered that there was a map so you could, you know, avoid the monsters if you wanted to. And sometimes if you don't provide a map, the reader will provide it for you. And these are reader-drawn maps. Um, so the good news is you don't have to be um, a good cartographer to write high fantasy. Um, this is my map that I drew for the Seven Realms, the original. And I cannot tell you how I labored over that and you know, that's still how it ended up. But I started doing the map so I could keep track of things, where I put things. Because you know what happens if you mess up? You get emails. <laughs> well, last time they went from here to there, it only took 10 days, and this time it took 100 days, and I thought this was in the mountains, and besides, yeah. So. <laughs> Um, I have readers who have read my books like 10 times, and they don't miss much. You can't get away with much. So I actually started the map um, so I could remember, you know, what's in the north, what's in the south. Um, and every time my, my characters went somewhere, I'd add something to the map. Even when I did the Air Chronicles, I used a map of Ohio because I didn't want to hear from Ohioans. I mean, ordinarily, I'm glad to hear from Ohioans, but, um, and there was actually an error in one of my books. Um, I have no idea um, what kind of spell came over me, but I had a character fall into Lake Erie and spit out salt water. And you really can't rely on your New York editors to catch that. They're like, oh, I, oh, really? It's not salt water. So a boy from Ontario wrote to me and said, you know, I love your books, but just so you know, Lake Erie is freshwater. And I'm like, I know. Well, how come on page 241? So this is the final map. This is um, Hyperion hired a cartographer to redraw the map. And that's how it has appeared in the books. There's actually, if you are writing fantasy, there's map making software out there. Um, a lot of it has been used for gaming, you know, because there are a lot of adventure games and so forth, people who write video games. Um, so this is a map made by that software. I have, I've not tried that. It's all I can do to put out a book a year <laughs> without But, you know, I mentioned that my experiences in Ohio um, helped me uh, put my characters in Ohio and hopefully put my readers in Ohio, but I've never been to the Seven Realms. So how do I put a reader there? Which words? Pardon me? Which words? How do you put it there with your words? Yeah, how, I mean, well, but what, what words could I use? Like you just made us do sensory um, descriptions. Mm-hmm. All of your senses with uh, small details. Mm-hmm. Like you said, the big details, even though that's, that's mm -hmm. huge, but something like, okay, you go to the ocean, and there's salt on your lips, and you go to this, and you notice that. Exactly. Did you all hear that? Whether you're going to an ocean, in the seven realms, or are you going to um, the ocean in Maine? There's a scent to oceans. Um, there's a way an ocean breeze feels on your skin. There's salt, she mentioned licking salt off your lips. 
So it's those specific, authentic details that will put the reader in the world you created. Um, sensory data that is common to your fictional world and the real world. You still take real life and you change it up. You're using familiar details from real life to make your world real. So specificity, authenticity, and detail. Um, if, your, if your characters are licking salt off their lip, lips at the seaside, hopefully you can put your readers there as well. I know the Seven Realms very well. Um, I actually um, wrote, I have 500,000 unpublished words written in the Seven Realms, so if you're ever feeling bad about it, I've written all this stuff, it's not published. Nothing is wasted. By the time I finished those 500,000 words, words, I really knew the Seven Realms very well. My editor said, this seems so real, and I said, well, yeah, I've spent a lot of time in it. Um, so I had a ready-made world ready to go and a map and all of that, and I was using specific details from my experiences to build the Seven Realms. So I haven't been to the mountain, mountainous queendom of the Fells, but I've been to Alberta. I've been to the Canadian Rockies. I happened to be in Yellowstone when I started to write The Demon King, and I thought, geysers. I can have geysers and hot springs, and wouldn't that be cool? Um, it might have been a completely different book if I'd been in, like, South America or something. So, so you use details. You know, what's, what is it like to look down over the wall of a castle? Um, um, there are a couple of methods of world building, and this more applies to fantasy because usually there's not... If you're, if you're setting your story in Ohio, it's mainly a matter of choosing what details you're going to use to put the reader there. Um, so you can kind of build the world as you go if you're writing fantasy. That's pretty much what I did with The Seven Realms. Um, and the good thing about that is there's less temptation to overwhelm the reader. Um, if you ever read a book where reading it was like hacking through a thicket, my son, uh, Eric, who is a big fantasy, was and is a big fantasy fan, when he was about 12, he was reading a book and all of a sudden he flings it across the room in disgust. And of course I say, we do not throw books in our house. And he said, a hundred pages and all they did was go down the road. <laughs> so for a long time I had that pasted over my computer. <laughs> you know, a hundred pages clearly that writer had offered way too much detail, um, much more than my son, even a fantasy fan that he was, was willing to tolerate. So, that sometimes when you do a lot of world building, you feel this need to put it all out there. <laughs> and I'm saying, don't. Um, are any of you familiar with Patricia Reed's um, questions for world building? It's on, the link is on your handout. Um, and again, the risk with this is that you may spend way too much time building your world and not enough time actually writing it, but it's, it is very interesting. She has, you know, things to think about. Um, what's the climate like? How would the climate affect how people make a living? If you live in the snowy mountains, are you likely to be a farmer? Probably not. You're going to have to find a different way to make a living. And so in the fells, the, con the most con they do raise sheep, um, and they raise some crops, but mainly they're traders and hunters and craftspeople. Um, they really get a lot of their food from the south, which is flatter and warmer. How does past history drive current events? Every place has a history, whether it's 
the U.S. or the Seven Realms. A lot of times that can be a setup for conflict. Um, have you noticed how very common it is in fantasy that there was this big op apocalyptic thing that happened and now everything's different because of that, um, some catastrophe? Um, how does diversity in race, language, and religion drive conflict? What's a form of government? What role does magic play in social status if you have magic in your world? What do they look like? Are there different races and cultures represented? I encourage you to um, have a diverse cast of characters. I think if you don't, it's a missed opportunity and readers deserve to be able to see themselves in the worlds that you create. It can also be a good source of conflict in the um, Queendom of the Fells, there are three main groups. There are the Vale Dwellers, who are the valley people. There are the clans who live in the mountains. And then there are the wizards who came in and conquered everybody a while back. And they are constantly squabbling. As one of my characters, Han Alistair, says, they can't agree that water is wet and the sky is blue. So you already have the bones of a story when you start out. If you do your, a good job on your setting, um, you don't have to work as hard coming up with a plot. There are stories like Into the Wild, has anyone read um, John Krakauer's story about a teenage boy who goes to Alaska? And in that case, the setting is the enemy. The setting is the opposition. Try to defy expectations. You know, killer unicorns, <laughs> urban owls, fat vampires, <laughs> friendly, gregarious, graceful zombies. You know, think outside the box a little bit. Are marriages arranged or self-managed? Are there plants and animals if you're creating a world that don't exist in our own? Um, I used a combination of real plants, medicinal plants, poisons, and so on, and um, some made-up ones. And I got into trouble with my translators because they're like, we can't find this maiden weed anywhere. And I'm like, yeah, I made that up. <laughs> um, I'm probably on some list because I'm always like Googling deadly plant poisons. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> Are there magical or mythical creatures? And these are some of the, the plants in the seven realms. Willow bark is uh, a pain reducer. That's where aspirin came from originally. Um, two-step lily I made up, but it's really cool because if somebody, they, they're lucky to make two steps before they drop. <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, is there a language of commerce, so-called common? And again, a lot of these things apply more to fantasy worlds. A lot of the magical terms used in the Air Chronicles come from Old English. There are Old English, English dictionaries um, online. And, um, you know, that was, that was handy. A lot of the slang used by Han Alistair and his ragger gang members comes from 18th century slang dictionaries. And those are online. And it's, it's really cool because go, gatekeepers don't get in my way so much. I'm writing about these teenagers and they're drinking Blue Ruin and they have no idea that it's gin. <laughs> <laughs> so these are some of the magical terms based on Old English. And these are some of the slang terms. Ace of spades is a widow. Uh, Bravo is a killer for hire. Darbies refer to handcuffs or manacles. Um, flash the hash is vomit. Yeah. Yeah. So you use that sparingly because, again, you don't want to overwhelm the reader. If they have to, I have a whole table of terms on my website for the um, obsessive reader, but nobody wants to have to go to a dictionary <laughs> constantly. So you just pepper them in. 
warfare and weaponry? Is it modern weapons or is it swords and um, do they have, in between the seven realms and the shattered realms, uh, my um, warring tribes got cannon. So there weren't any cannon in the seven realms, but 25 years later they have. Now, a lot of people think you write fantasy because you don't like to do research. You just make it up. How hard could that be? But the fact is, you actually have to do research on those details that you include in your fantasy world. For example, how far can a horse and rider travel in a day? If you mess that up, you immediately lose all the horse people. You know, uh, I guess you could make a case that horses in the seven realms can go 500 miles, but no, they're gonna say this rider does not know what she's talking about. Um, I had a friend who's a horse person and there was a scene in a fantasy novel where a horse was absolutely acting like no horse ever would and she's just like, I'm done. Um, what kind of metals are, were used in medieval weaponry? How do you sharpen a sword? Um, what are me medieval toilets like? I spent more time trying to figure out how someone would calm a horse that was rearing and I contacted my horsey friends and I said, okay, what would, where would, would you try to grab the bridle? Would you come in from the side? Because that stuff's important. Um, if you mess that up, you'll lose your reader. That doesn't mean that I have to tell them everything I know about horses at this point. A lot of the action on, in uh, the Shattered Realms takes place on sailing ships. One of the characters is a pirate, Evan Strangward. Oh my gosh, you know there's a whole complete different language used in sailing. It's just, you know, and nothing, yeah. And so I spent all this time reading through glossaries of sailing terms. I went to Mystic Seaport. Um, and there were guides there. They showed me how you furl up a sail because again, I'll lose the sailing people if I mess that up. Um, again, setting can drive your conflict. Um, is the world isolated or vulnerable? Um, are there racial, cultural, religious divisions? Um, Carthus is a place in the Shattered Realms and it's a desert kingdom. Um, it's very dry and then the mountains behind them are all infested with dragons. So again, farming isn't a really good option there. Um, so they become pirates, you know, and that's the Barbary pirates. Um, that was pretty much the case with them. So I'm gonna spend a little time talking about magic because some of you probably are writing fantasy um, and that might be an element in the world that you build. What's magic? Yes? Science that hasn't been explained. <laughs> Science that hasn't been explained yet. I mean, obviously a lot of things that we um, think of as technology would have been magic in another um, you know, at another time. So it's um, things that cannot be explained by natural laws, we understand it. As far as we know, people cannot fly through the air without benefit of some kind of machine, right? So in fantasy, a lot of people think of fantasy as being totally off on its own with not much in common with, but the first three elements of mainstream fiction and fantasy fiction are the same. Characters, setting, although you have more options in fantasy for setting, plot, and then magic is what sets fantasy apart. Now, any magical universe has its own laws, 
that you can't change in the course of a story. You have to tell the reader what the rules are and magic must have limits. Why is that? The Superman effect, explain please. In the beginning of the Superman stories, Superman was so strong, so powerful, that there really wasn't any story. He showed up, did whatever needed to be done. There was never a conflict. There was, he never had to struggle for, for anything. And they introduced the kryptonite to give him a weakness so that Superman actually had a chance to struggle, had the possibility of failure. Otherwise, no story. Who's going to win? every single time. Man of Steel, X-ray vision, flies through the air. You know, you know the ending of every story before it begins. So uh, story is built from conflict. No conflict, no story. So that's why you never see people who can predict the future unfailingly. Because you have no story. Nobody would ever run into any trouble because they know what's going to happen. Why can't you just change the rules anytime you want? Oh, that's really inconvenient that I have this rule. I'll just change it. Your readers would have a fit. Yeah, how would you feel if you know how where you always get um, you always get the three wishes. You know the person gets the three wishes and then they waste them and then they really get into a jam. What if all of a sudden um, the genie said, "Well, I lied. You get four wishes." Like, there's probably a story out there like that. Um, or all of a sudden you're going along and, and you know how you're reading and you're like, how is the author going to get this character out of this? And then all of a sudden they go invisible. And there's never been any mention of that ever. Yeah, yeah um, I never know how to pronounce that. Deus ex machina? Yeah. You know, some really um, unbelievable thing happens that gets them out of trouble. So readers will be, they'll feel cheated. That's not fair. Um, things to think about if you have magic in your world. Do non-magical people know there's magic? Is it kind of part of everyday life? You know, do, do you all know people who happen to be magicians or sorcerers? Um, in Harry Potter, the Ministry of Magic goes to great length to make sure muggles don't find out about wizards. I never quite understood that. I always felt like, you know, you're wizards, you're powerful, you would, this is probably exposing a um, tyrannical um, <laughs> um, part of me, but I'm like, they would be throwing their weight around. They wouldn't be sneaking around trying to avoid being discovered. In White Cat, which is by Holly Black, magic is known, but it's forbidden. Um, so people that perform magic are criminals. In the Air Chronicles, the unaware are unaware of the five magical guilds. So everyday people don't know that there's this big magical battle going on in Ohio. Think about what can and can't be accomplished through magic. And again, you have to be careful. What are the limits? How do wizards try to get around them? Is there a price that magicians um, have to pay for their magic? Lifelong celibacy, years of study, shortened lifespan. Do they have to uh, make a sacrifice in order to perform magic? Um, in Stormcaster, Evan Strangward is a blood mage, meaning that he can bind others with his blood, but of course that means he has to bleed. Um, is magic just like raw power? Can it be shaped by spell work? Um, in Harry Potter, one of the um, things they're learning at Hogwarts is, you know, Wingardia Labiosa. 
So not only did you have to have a wand and be a wizard, but you had to learn charms. Um, where does magic come from? From inside the magician? From the natural world? Peoria, Illinois? Is there an unlimited supply of magic or does the wizard have to save it up? In the um, Seven Realms world, um, wizards have amulets which store magical energy and in order to do something um, powerful, they have to save it up for a while. And just to make things even more difficult, the amulets are made by the clans and clans and wizards despise each other. Conflict. Are wizards born with magic or does it surface in puberty or um, after training? Um, it's, it's interesting because I write young adult fantasy, which is I, probably more than half of my readers are adults, but it's very common in fantasy for the main character, the magical character, to be an adolescent because that's when the farm boy finds out that he's the heir of some legacy or you find the dragon egg or, you know, that sort of thing. In Cynthia Lydic Smith's tantalized series, Werewolves and Vampires Openly Roam Austin, Texas. Um, one way of limiting magic is by requiring tools. If Harry doesn't have the wand, he can't do magic. If Ron's wand gets broken, he can't do magic. So even a powerful magical practitioner um, his magic is limited if he doesn't have access to the tools of the trade. And a lot of magical stories are about people on the hunt for some powerful magical artifact. Um, wands, staffs, amulets, magical rings. It may require a spoken spell and it might be complex and difficult to learn. Mickey thought he knew what he was doing in The Sorcerer's Apprentice and he got himself into a lot of trouble. Mickey was saying, how hard could it be? In Bartimaeus, I don't know if any of you have read, it's kind of, yay, there's one. It's, it's really kind of an un, underappreciated series, in my opinion. It's about a, a, a London in, that's ruled by magicians through their power over genies. They can conjure up genies and force them to do their will. However, if you, you have to draw a really complicated design on the floor and speak a really complicated incantation and if you get any part of it wrong, the genie comes and tears you limb from limb. So there's a real incentive to study up before you start conjuring up genies. Why do vampires have rules? Because otherwise it's like Superman, vampires always win. You know, they're very charming, they're very appealing, they're immensely strong, they can turn into a bat and fly through the air. Um, they're gonna win every single time, unless you have that crucifix, <laughs> or unless you don't invite them into your house in the first place. Um, so, so, yeah. Um, it may require a specific gesture um, there might be a magical hierarchy, like hedge magic, um, uh, earth magic versus high magic. Um, are there different guilds or um, races that are limited to a narrow focus? Do practitioners use any performing enhancing drugs? So in Magical Rules in the Seven Realms, wizards produce magical energy constantly, must be stored in amulets in order to work magic. Amulets are made by and controlled by the spirit clans, enemies of wizards. A session of spell casting depletes a wizard's amulet and he or she cannot work more magic until it's repleted. So, I mean, what magic adds um, to a story is just another opportunity for conflict. Not only is Buffy the Vampire Slayer forced to navigate the social minefield of high school, there's a hellhole under the cafeteria, right? Um, 
Princess Rosanna Mariana stands to inherit a political snake pit of a queendom from her mother, the queen, if she can manage to hold off a rebellion of powerful wizards desperate to regain power. In The Warrior Air, Jack Swift's girlfriend just broke up with him. The principal hates him, and he's worried he won't make the soccer team. Also, two powerful wizard houses are hunting him, meaning to play him in a deadly magical tournament. So plot and story are always by taking it things when things are bad, making them worse. And magic can be a tool you can use if you're so inclined. So I'm not going to have you do this because we're kind of want to leave a little time for questions. But if you are incorporating magic into your stories, think about who has magic. Everybody. Um, just a um, limited group of people. Do you have to be born with it or can it be acquired? Um, what can magic do and not do? I, I generally don't have lamps turning into cats or anything that. <laughs> um, it's usually more a matter of energy, magical energy. What are the limits? Is there a cost? Are magical practitioners respected, feared, or despised. Now, um, finally, I mentioned earlier that one of the challenges in writing is deciding what will put the reader into a new place, um, but doing it efficiently. If you're writing a fictional world, a magical world, you begin with the real world and the ordinary and introduce the extraordinary. You can allow the reader to discover the magical world along with the viewpoint character. Avoid really complicated names and places. You know, apostrophes. Apostrophes are not required. Um, have you heard of Hemingway's Iceberg Principle? This is one of my favorite rules of writing. Um, he says, I always try to write on the principle of the iceberg. There's seven eighths of it underwater for every part that shows. Anything you know you can eliminate, it only strengthens your iceberg. If a writer omits something because he doesn't know it, though, there's a hole in the story. In other words, no reader ever wants to know everything that you know. <laughs> Trust me, they don't. Um, but all of this knowledge that you have um, supports the story, and it gives it an authority and a confidence, so the reader believes in it. Um, if you're trying to get away with something because you haven't figured something out, then your story loses confidence, the reader loses confidence. So you're always going to know a lot more than the reader, and that's okay. Overfocus on setting can distract from action. It's like watching somebody's unedited vacation photos. <laughs> Have you ever done that? You know, you're like, okay, that's enough. I think I got it, you know. <laughs> so you have to choose the right photos, the right details. Um, and what I like to do is deliver background setting information on a needs to know basis. When I critique manuscripts, and you know, and I have done both, you know, real world and fantasy man manuscripts, um, some people feel compelled to tell me everything about um, the, uh, one writer I was reading, and and she felt like she needed to have a scene in which she inter introduced the character's entire family, and you know, I don't care about that right now. I don't need to know it. Don't tell me until I need to know it. And then you put it in in a subtle way. Um, I don't need to know every detail of a character's appearance right away. You know, it's not, leave me room. I'll do the work. If you don't do it, I will fill in. Um, so think of editing those photos down to you're the ones that best tell the story of your journey. Choose images that are atmospheric, visually compelling, drive it forward. 
And you can, one thing, one way to be efficient is to deliver setting through the eyes of a character because guess what? You're delivering character and setting. The reader is learning about the character as well. Um, it's characters really that propel a, a reader through the story. So the most important thing you can do as opposed to um, you know, starting with an entire overview of the history of the place is allowing the reader to form a relationship with the character. Mainstream readers are not going to be so smitten by your fabulous magical system that they overlook characters in plot. Not everything you know needs to make it onto the page. A fictional world should not be a thicket the reader has to hack through. Remember, I love this from Lincoln Michelle. It isn't a world that a writer is creating, it's a story. And you may think, well, you know, I came here to learn about world building. <laughs> but what I'm trying to do is, what we need to do is stay out of the reader's way when we're telling a story. Representing reality is simply one way of telling a story, one house in the city of fiction. Um, he likes to use the term world conjuring, and I do kind of like that. It, word, world conjuring does not attempt to construct a scale model in the reader's bedroom. <laughs> um, you are, um, through your words, you're conjuring up the world in the reader's head, and they are partnering with you. One reason reading is not like watching a movie is that both reader and writer are active. So this is an example of delivering setting through a character's eyes. This is Madison Moss, and she's in the small town of Trinity. Trinity Square was a holiday postcard from the past. Snowy common surrounded by the weathered stone buildings of the college. Bows and greenery draped over the old-fashioned street lamps. Quaint storefronts glittered with their holiday offerings, and shoppers hustled by with bundles and bags. Totally perfect. Totally annoying, but better than home. Back in Colton County, she was the subject of sermons in hangdog little churches where sweaty-handed preachers used her as a bad example, which they bellowed and whispered, fire starter. People crossed the street when they saw her coming. They collected into prissy little groups after she passed by like gossiping starlings. So what have you learned? Pardon me? She was an outcast. Is she glad to shake the, uh, the dirt of Colton County off her shoes? Yes, ma'am. So we know something more about Madison. And we also know something about the town of Trinity. Does it kind of remind you of Hudson, maybe? <laughs> So in writing fantasy for teens, it's especially important because teens are not looking for writers showing off. They are reading for story. And I think that's why there's so many adult readers of YA books, because a lot of us are looking for story as well. And for those who do care about all the detail, um, again, maps, glossaries, genealogies, you can put that on the website. <laughs> if, um, you know, once your work is before readers. Um, so if somebody wants to know all of the, um, all of the magical guilds and their, you know, where they came from or the history or a whole glossary of people's um, names, they can find it. And this is um, from my website. Um, so about the Air Chronicles and there's kind of a glossary. Um, this is about thieves slang. Um, so um, just to the sort of end of presentation commercial, 
Um, my uh, series set in Ohio is called The Air Chronicles. The Seven Realms is high fantasy set in the queendom of the Fells and the evil um, empire of Arden. The Shattered Realms is my newest series. It stands alone. It's set in the same world as the Seven Realms, but it's about a generation later. And the first three books are out, and Deathcaster comes um, in March. I'm on Facebook, Blogspot, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, so, are there any questions? Yes. Um, well, the, the, if you publish through a mainstream publisher, the publisher finds the artist. And um, my first, well, almost all of my early, earlier books were, the covers were done by an illustrator named Larry Rostand. And he's a British illustrator. If you're interested, you can look at his website. And so my publisher handled that. Um, I. The Shattered Realms, I'm with a new publisher, and so they went with um, a different illustrator. Um, I think the Hyperion, who was my initial publisher, if your books do well, they like to have that brand on the books a little bit, so someone seeing it would go, oh, that's, that's a Chima book. Um, I liked the early covers um, because, um, they're iconic, you know, um, fantasy can have really lurid covers. Have you noticed that, where you're just like, you, I want to put a brown paper uh, cover on there. You know, it's like some romance covers, you know. And these, to me, were the kind of covers that anyone could carry. My Air Chronicles, if you're an adult and you're reading it, you can carry it around and not have people, you know, um, look down on you. So I, I, it's a cover that says, I am for you. I am for everyone. Yeah? Uh, does the, did the artist like match what you were picturing that item <laughs> to be? Or did, were there some where you're like, this is not what I'm looking for? Yeah, well, um, generally, um, after the first book or two, I learned that I should be thinking about what should go on the cover and I would have a description. And then when my publisher said, well, what could we put on the cover? I would send the description of that that appeared in print. Now, um, The Demon King, um, that cover was the first one done by Larry, um, the, the first in this series done by Larry Rostant. And I had a description. What's on the cover is the amulet that belonged to the Demon King who almost destroyed the world. And I had a description. So um, this came in, and I'm like, oh, I love it, but it, it doesn't match the way it was described in the book, knowing that I would get emails. And they said, oh, you know, Larry's kind of fragile right now. Could you change what's in the book to, you know? And I'm like, when do I get to be fragile? Yeah, so it, it kind of works both ways. Usually they'll try to make it match, like when we get to these, there are people. And so I would, again, um, point out that um, it's, she's still not very um, sturdy, the um, Alyssa Anna, um, Reza, who's on the cover of Shadowcaster, she's a warrior and she's muscled and she's built and I the first version that came through she looked um, kind of waif like you know I'm like no I know she's a princess she's a warrior princess you know give her some you know so um, and the um, Evan Strangward there is very much the way um, I envisioned him so other questions yeah. What's your preferred method of keeping all this world building straight? Like, what's your, what's your, um, your, your sort of roadmap? 
okay? What's my preferred method of keeping all this straight? Um, the map is the one thing, you know, because that, and when I went to the Shattered Realms, I drew, a, sketched out a map of Carthus, which it's, it's referred to several times during the Seven Realms. And I had actually, you know, that 500,000 word, unpublished words, I'd written some stories set in Carthus, so I knew it was out there. Um, but I drew a more detailed map, and then they created that. The other thing I do is I keep a table of characters, um, whatever description of them is included in the story, um, what books they appear in. And I learned my lesson on that because I had a character in the Air Chronicles, Leisha Middleton, I don't know if any of you read. Um, I, she was in the first book and I never intended to bring her back, so I didn't take good notes. And then I found something for her to do in the wizard air and then the dragon air and by, she was one of the major characters by the time I got the sorcerer air. So then I get an email. I'm just wondering what color Leisha's eyes are because they keep changing. <laughs> because I, I tried to look back through, I thought, well, I didn't describe her that closely. So yeah, physical attributes. So um, it's not fun to hunt through a 600 page book looking to see if you mention somebody's eye color. Yeah, so it's a real, I mean, I use a word table, there's, you know, but um, that works for me, kind of a series Bible. Other questions? Yes. <laughs> what kind of monsters are in Lake Erie? Um, well, there's the Red Dog of Detroit. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Yeah, he, he appears in times of tragedy and stuff. But I, um, shoot, it's been a while since I looked at that story. It was one of my favorite short stories. It was about, it was in an anthology about warriors. And there was, a, a, a character came back from, uh, the war in Iraq with PTSD and he's like sleeping under a bridge by the Cuyahoga River and the magical denizens of the um, lake come and call on him for help because the, um, there's a major monster out there that's eating everybody and so he goes into battle with the, you know, his allies and they um, go, to, I won't tell you how it comes out, but yeah, um, I don't know if I put anything on my website about Lake Erie monsters, but I still haven't let go of that. I may return to that um, setting. Yeah. Um, there's no rule on that. Um, it depends on what kind of story you're writing. Um, I always use the romance, romance genre as an example of where physical descriptions are very important. You know, I don't know how many times we heard about Edward's our ivory skin in, in Twilight and all this stuff. Um, teenagers do have a tendency to you know, because when you're a teenager, you're so appearance focused, you're worried about your own appearance, and you're, and they're like, no, we're not. But, um, it, you know, so a lot of times there'll be a certain desire. One of some of my other presentations, I have fan art of my characters, you know, that readers have drawn, and they're all different. And that's just fine, they're all correct because the reader is partnering with me and they're creating in their head. So, um, yeah, there's, I mean, there are stories that are written that have very little about appearance. Um, one challenge that I, I, I like to have a diverse cast, but if I don't mention 
um, that someone is, a, a, you know, in a particular, you know, person of color, whatever. The default always seems to be white, at least in this. So it's like I want um, people to know they're represented in the book. But if I do that, then I have to mention the skin color of white people too, because otherwise it's, you know, it's not even handed. So I do like sometimes to make sure that readers know that um, it's a diverse. And in the in the realms, um, people with clan blood, um, you know, people with mixed blood are discriminated against, you know. So it adds some conflict to the story. But if it's not important to your story, no, you don't have to have a lot of description. I mean, I think Sherlock Holmes, that was got, taking it a little far, but. So the question is, you know, why did I go into high fantasy? I have always, I, you know, I cut my teeth on high fantasy as a young reader. You know, I read David Edding's books and Mercedes Lackey and, um, and of course, Lord of the Rings. And I've always loved that kind of story. So I thought, yeah, you know, I want to do that. I like people, you know, riding on horses and living in castles and all that sort of thing. So, um, so yeah, I wanted to tell that kind of story. But I, you know, right now I'm kind of trying to decide what to do next. And, you know, it may not be that I'll always write fantasy. I, th I think writing is hard enough. Um, and so I think it's important to write from the heart and write the story that speaks to you at that particular time. So, yeah. Yeah, um, she's saying, you know, I, you know, was told to, you know, limit the script, you know, some books that there's only a paragraph, and Lord of the Rings, there's page after page after page after page. Now, keep in mind that Tolkien wrote his books back in the 40s. I mean, they are, um, it's an older style of writing, and not a style that, um, you know, some people, um, especially, you um, teens, I would say, are not real patient with that kind of writing. I was, you know, when I read it, I was just like, you know, lying awake thinking black writers were going to come through my window. Very scary stuff. But, um, I mean, it's interesting the way Tolkien attacked his books because the very first thing he did was write an elven language. And because he was a linguist, so that's where he started. He had this whole language, now what? So he created a world for that language to go in and then the stories. So it's a little bit backwards from the way I usually work. What I tell, well, my best advice is to tell the reader what they need to know now to stay in the story. And I'm convinced that most readers are more patient with being a little confused than with being buried in pages and pages of description. So I try to include the details that will put them in the world. And, uh, you know, I don't tell them about the whole magical system up front. It's discovered as the reader goes through the story. So. Well, we probably should go on to um, signing. Um, Kate has books in the back. Um, I'm going to go back there. I've got bookmarks um, to give away as well. So I really appreciate. I'm I'm, I'm just um, amazed by the turnout today and excited that so many people are interested in writing. Um, you know, I took my first writing workshop at the Hudson Library. My first fiction writing workshop. I took here at the Hudson Library. So.